Good morning, my name is Nigel Henley, Training and Communication Specialist for the Division of Health and Wellness School Nutrition Programs team. I want to thank you for joining us on today's Child Nutrition Programs Meals Call. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistical items um, with you this morning. As I can imagine, many of you on the line today have quite a few questions related to the updated meal guidance and the recently, re recently released USDA waivers. For questions pertaining to today's topic, free, feel free to send them to us um, using the chat feature. If you're on your mobile device, that chat feature is going to be in the top right hand corner of your screen. If you are on your laptop or computer, that is going, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you will see a toolbar pop up where you'll be able to find that chat feature. Um, I've just sent a message. I sent a message a little bit earlier. I'll go ahead and send another one now. Um, one second, let me send that message to you all now. And I've just sent that message. If you find the chat feature, look for the orange bubble and that'll let you know that you're at the chat feature. It's going to look like a, a text box with lines in it. Once you find that chat, go ahead and send us a quick hello so that we know that you found it. Um, what we found over multiple times of doing these open calls is that if you don't see that chat feature, what sometimes helps is if you log out of the call and log back in. Um, and a lot of times that will fix the issue that you're having around not seeing the chat. Um, so go ahead and send us a quick hello. That'll ensure that we see your chat and that we know that you have seen the chat. Um, also, there will be an opportunity at the end of the call for you all to unmute yourselves and ask questions verbally. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a question and answer session at the end, near the end of today's call. Additionally, I want to remind you all that today's call is recorded to ensure that we capture all questions submitted to the team. A recording of this call will be available in the following days. While we're on that topic, please keep in mind that all participants on today's call are muted to reduce background noise as we go throughout the presentation. Again, I want to say thank you all for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to Liz to introduce the rest of the team. Thank you, Nigel, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our call to review the recent waivers released by USDA and their impact on meal service here in the district. On our slide, you can see an overview of what we'll talk about today. We'll start with some introductions, discuss the purpose of today's call, and provide updates on new guidance ASI released earlier this week for school food authorities. Then we'll hear from some of your peers on their tentative plans for meal service moving forward. We will discuss next steps and have time for Q&A before we wrap up. In the interest of time, I'll introduce our speakers for today. I'm Elizabeth Leach, the School Nutrition Programs Manager here at OSSI, and you've already heard from Nigel Henley, who makes sure that these calls are possible. Additionally, from OSSI, we'll hear from Suzanne Henley and Kimberly Thompson. Then we'll have the opportunity to speak with representatives from two of our largest meal sponsors in the district, Brittany Stretzberry from DCPS and Angela Tucker from DPR. At OSSI, the nutrition programs teams have been working to provide timely guidance on how to serve meals since March. And one way we've been doing this is by hosting open calls. Today, we're happy to have SFAs, SFSP sponsors, and CACFP sponsors joining us on this call. In addition to providing updates and reviewing the guidance, we'll hear from two sponsors, respond to the questions we received through a survey in advance of today's call, and answer questions that you ask in today's chat. Without further ado, let's dive into our guidance updates. Earlier this week, OSSI released updated meal guidance for school food authorities. The guidance will be dropped into the chat box now. There are a number of topics updated within this guidance, and we encourage all school food authorities to read, to read through the highlighted portions and familiarize yourself with each of these updates, as we won't be reviewing each one of them today. What we will be focusing on today is the ability to use the Summer Food Service Program 
and the seamless summer option to serve meals through the end of this calendar year. Moving forward, I'm going to use a lot of the acronyms that you see on this page today um, to help not get tongue tied too much. <laughs> Previously, USDA was only allowing meals to be served through the child nutrition programs traditionally used during the school year. And that includes the school breakfast program, national school lunch program, after school snack program, and child and adult care food program, including at risk supper. This meant that students had to rely on the SFA in which they were enrolled for meals. As of August 31st, SFAs and sponsors may now serve and be reimbursed for meals through the SFSP and the SSO, which is how meal service had been operating since March. These two programs allow open feeding sites, meaning that meals can be served to students 18 and under, regardless of which SFA or childcare facility they are enrolled in. Please note that this new option to serve meals through the SFSP or SSO is allowed only through December 31st through the end of this calendar year. In addition, USDA has clarified that when virtual or non-congregate after-school programming is offered, after-school snack and at-risk supper meals can be served and reimbursed for. Additionally, students do not have to be engaged in the virtual after-school programming offered to receive a meal. The programs just must be offered. Overall, these updates are very good news uh, for meal access in the district. They will hopefully increase meal access for students and reduce the administrative functions that you as SFAs and sponsors have to do. With that, we know there are a lot of questions about operationalizing this change and we hope to address some of those today. Let's first start with school food authorities. Here is a comparison of all available programs to inform how you provide meals from now through the end of the calendar year. SFAs can choose to either serve meals through the traditional school meal programs as planned, or serve meals through the SFSP or SSO. SFAs originally planned to provide meals through the traditional meal programs, but now that SFSP and SSO are options, it's beneficial to explore each program. This chart provides a high level overview of the differences between programs. Benefits of utilizing the SFSP or SSO include the ability to serve meals to any persons 18 or younger through open meal sites, the benefit that all meals provided are free to students. Uh, another benefit is that in using SFSP or SSO, accountability can be taken via a tally sheet, and that's a simplified method at each meal distribution point. And specifically for SFSP, a simpler meal pattern is required, and each meal served is reimbursed at a higher rate. One possible drawback of operating SFSP or SSO is that it limits meal service to two meals per day, while the traditional school meal programs allow for more meals to be served each day. These are all things to consider while you and your organizations determine how to continue with meal service. Later on this call, we will discuss next steps needed in order to switch programs if you go in that direction. Before I pass over the microphone, I'll just remind folks of the waivers available right now. Please reference the OSSI guidance for detail on these waivers and specifics for the new waivers you see in red. And with that, I will hand it over to Suzanne Henley. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, she did a great job of talking about the benefits of um, SFSP. And the next two slides, I will be speaking to CACFP sponsors. So now that SFSP is allowed to operate through the end of December 2020, CS CACFP sponsors have another program to serve their communities. If you want to stick to operating CACFP, that's fine. We just want to make you aware that you have another option. As you can see on the slide, uh, CACFP at risk and SFSP have some similar benefits. As a sponsor, the major differences you will notice 
uh, in day-to-day -day operations of, SF, of SFSP is that you won't need to take point-of-service meal counts, children will not uh, need to sign in when they arrive, and you won't need to offer an enrichment activity. Over the long term, you will notice that the SFSP reimbursement you receive is higher than what you would receive through CACFP. If you choose to operate SFSP, the children you serve could benefit from receiving two meals each day compared to receiving one meal and one snack each day through CACFP at risk. If you do decide to switch to S to the summer meals program, you can still serve the same sites and children you were planning to serve through the CACFP at risk, and possibly you could add sites, specifically those sites that were not able to offer an enrichment activity this fall. Uh, I do want to highlight that USDA has not confirmed that sponsors are able to provide a child with meals through both the SFSP and CACFP at risk. This was the option last spring, but we are not yet positive that this is an option for the fall. In the next slide, uh, we'll, we will compare CACFP child care and before and after program with SFSP. There are major differences between SFSP and CACFP child care and before and after programs. If you operate the CACFP, you understand the program, so I'm not going to get into the details. Instead, let's look at how SFSP could impact the sites you serve. Um, I'm identifying two major differences. One, siblings or other young family members who receive meals or can receive meals at the same site as their enrolled family member. So this means families won't need to tra travel to various sites to pick up meals for their children. Number two, although you can serve CACFP meals at, C at CACFP facilities that are closed, um, operating SFSP at a facility that is closed would probably be uh, much easier. For example, the facility would not need to collect IES forms, generate daily attendance sheets, um, or take point of service by name meal counts. Of course, there are other factors to consider in this decision between CACFP and SFSP such as completing a different application, learning a different mail pattern, and updating your vendor contract if you have one. So we do want to keep those in mind. The bottom line, if your organization or facilities were interested in serving meals in a less restrictive fashion, SFSP could meet your needs. Now I will give the floor to DCPS and DPR. They are the largest meals program sponsors, and we thought hearing a bit about their plans would help us better understand what the meal access landscape will look like this fall. First, we will hear from Brittany Stretzberry, a nutrition compliance specialist with DCPS. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so my name is Brittany Stretzberry. I am the uh, Nutrition and Compliance Specialist with DCPS. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief update of uh, DCPS's plans for uh, moving forward. We are actively working towards moving back to SFSP. Um, we have not established a timeline for when we would be able to start serving meals under this program. Um, we're waiting for additional guidance you know, from this call as well as from DCPS leadership internally. Um, but we will be sure to share more information as soon as we have that available. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Now I would turn it over to Angela Tucker. She is the Supervisory Nutrition Specialist with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Good morning, everyone. So we are excited about this program because one of our challenges that we had uh, with participating in CACFP that um, we had to scale back our offerings for um, what was allowed for, because as we didn't have enrichment programs, we had a lot of virtual programs, but on a, and in person, but on a smaller scale. So we're looking to re-engage with sites that we served this summer um, 
with non-DPR rec centers and our non um, and DPR rec centers as well, as they have heard about the waiver and they're excited and they've been contacting us. So right now we have a tentative timeline of October 1st and we're working along with the contract, our contract administrator, specialist uh, to get all those details uh, finalized. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. to Brittany and Angela. So now that we have heard from DCPS and DPR, let's discuss some of the things you'll want to consider for your meal service plan and next steps to get there. First, we recommend discussing meal service options with your organizational leadership to determine which direction you wanna go in. Consider the needs of your students and your community and the impact a switch in meal service may have. As we just heard from DCPS and DPR, while they are considering reopening meal sites, which would um, provide more meal access to students, those sites are not currently open and will take some time and planning and operational logistics to get open. So please keep that in mind as you're making your decision. Additionally, keep in mind the operational, um, to keep in mind any potential changes um, and have a discussion with your vendor and food service management companies that you work with. Um, we know that many of you are in contracts with, with vendors and food service management companies, and please make sure you engage in that discussion um, while you're thinking about making that change. Um, make sure to develop a timeline for rollout that allows for advanced notification to students and families. If there's going to be a change in meal service, we want to make sure that students and families know that in advance and know where to go and how to get a meal before that change goes into effect. As with meal distribution since March, the coronavirus.dc.gov website will continue to be updated with meal distribution sites. And lastly, of course, we couldn't not mention Orchard today. Um, once you have made a decision, please make sure to update the applicable um, applications that you have in Orchard to reflect your meal service. And myself and Suzanne will go a little bit further into detail into each of those now. As a reminder, NSLP applications were due August 31st, and for SFAs who have not yet submitted an application, please do so as soon as possible. We do anticipate that many SFAs will want to amend their applications in the following ways. First, you may want to update sites to be either active as actively serving or inactive if they're not actively serving. Second, for those choosing to operate the seamless summer option, um, if you hadn't already elected to participate in that program with your, within your NSLP application, you'll want to amend your application and add that program. Lastly, you'll want to ensure your waiver requests are up to date. SFAs that have been approved for waivers for NSLP and the school breakfast program don't have to reapply. Those waiver approvals will directly apply to SSO. Suzanne will talk about SFSP waivers in just a moment. Details on how to amend your NSLP application and make these changes are included in the guidance we released earlier this week, so please reference that guidance for specifics on updating your application. And now I'll hand it over to Suzanne. Thanks, Liz. If you um, participated in the Summer Food Service Program this, you know, a few weeks ago, basically this summer, um, and you intend to resume your operations for this fall, your organization can start SFSP once your fall application updates are complete. Um, at the state agency, we will work very quickly to approve your applications, and we do not intend to cause any delay in the start of the program. Uh, on this slide, we're covering application highlights. If you are return, if you are a returning sponsor, please refer to the email that Nicole King sent on Friday, September 4th for detailed application instructions. So there are three steps. One, 
your SFSP application for activities prior to August 31st must be complete, updated, and approved before you update your SFSP application for fall 2020. We know that many of you already have this portion of your application uh, approved and finalized, but we just want to highlight that. Step two, you would update your fall, your fiscal year 2020 application and um, the waiver registration uh, form that we have sent to you all to reflect your fall 2020 operations. Um, uh, we also want to highlight that at this point, organizations are able to add new sites. So um, you can go ahead and add a site that maybe did not participate this summer. The third step. So, I'm sure we all realize the new fiscal year starts October 1st. So beginning October 1st, you will be required to complete and uh, submit your FY21 Summer Food Service Program application. We ask that you don't start the FY21 application too soon, like started around October 1st, so that as much information as possible carries forward into that new application. It'll just make it easier for you uh, in the long term. And as a reminder, all SFSP uh, site mail operations uh, must conclude no later than December 31st, so this should also be reflected in your application. And if there are any uh, sponsors, schools, FSAs on this call that are interested in starting SFSP and you haven't participated in before, that's fine. You would just need to complete the full application. Uh, and for more information, you can contact the SFSP coordinator, Nicole King, and I will drop her email in the chat and we will send it out uh, later after the call. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly for some questions and answers. Good morning, this is Kimberly. Um, our first question is for Liz and maybe um, Suzanne can chime in as well. We've currently applied for the NSLP program, but not summer food service. Can we be authorized and apply for both programs and choose to operate under summer food service instead of NSLP? or at least through December 31st, and then switch back to the lunch program on January 1st? Great question, thanks for asking that. Short answer is yes. Um, you can apply for both NSLP and SFSP. You can operate SFSP from now in, until the allowable December 31st, and then plan to operate NSLP afterwards. Suzanne, would you have anything to add to that? Nope, that sounds right. Just, you know, if you do want to make that switch, make sure you get started on that SFSP application. And then the next question Alex responded to in the chat, but Liz, if you can just voice over the response again. Um, a school operates under the Summer Food Service Program through December 31st. Does that mean schools um, do not have to do farm verification in October and November? That's a very great question and a question that we posed to USDA. Um, we do not have an answer yet on how the verification process, which is usually conducted in the fall, will be handled. So as soon as we have more information on that, we will share with you all. And then the next question is for, for both of you. Um, can you all discuss the benefits of SSO in the Summer Food Service Program if a school is trying to decide which program to operate? Sure, I'll start and take a stab um, and then Suzanne, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, I think every every LEA or every school food authority um, should look at what their student needs are and it may be there may be a, de a better fit for each LEA. Um, some of the benefits of switching to um, SSO or SFSP are that you can you can provide meals via an open feeding site. So instead of having to make sure the student is enrolled at your school, um, you can provide to any student in the in the neighborhood that comes. That also allows students that go to your school but may not be in your neighborhood to go to other open feeding sites throughout the city that may be closer to home for them. Um, so that's a real benefit. Um, 
For SFSP specifically, as we discussed, there is a um, simplified meal pattern as well as a higher reimbursement rate. In addition, um, taking accountability for SSO and SFSP is more simplified than than using the traditional meal programs. So you can take accountability for each meal served using a basic tally sheet, um, which is much easier at a meal distribution site. And I think one last thing I'll add is that SFSP and SSO allow for meals to be served seven days a week, while the traditional school meal programs require meals to be served and reimbursed only on operating school days. Um, so apologies for not highlighting that before, but that is a big distinction, um, is that if you're serving meals through NSLP, those meals are only reimbursable on operating school days, whereas SSO and SFSP allow meals to be served and reimbursed for seven days a week. And, and let's hear from Suzanne in case she, I'm sure she has more things to add as well. I don't have much to add, just kind of highlighting what Liz said about the the flexibility it offers the community. So, you know, if a family has children that are in, you know, various schools or various school systems, um, you know, those children can go or students can go to one site and receive meals rather than, you know, ping ponging across the district. All right, thank you for that. Um, our next question, Suzanne, is for you. Um, are we able to apply for the CACFP program for fiscal year 2021 while participating in the summer food service program? Absolutely, yes. You can um, keep going on all of your applications. In fact, I recommend that um, because, you know, January 1st, you'll be ready to go with CACFP. That is fine. Um, I just want to, let's see. I just want to highlight that operation, I think I mentioned it earl earlier, but operating the, you know, the program simultaneously and serving the same set of children through both programs. We don't have clarity if that's an option. So um, yes, you can have the applications going at the same time, but operating them at the same time in the same place, um, we aren't clear if that's possible yet. And then Suzanne, you can probably answer the next question or if Angela is available. Um, a school wants to know if DPR sites are currently serving food. Yes, uh, DPR is currently serving meals. Uh, we're participating in the CACFP. We started on the 8th, actually this week, and um, we're only serving, well, right now it's only 10, and we were looking to expand to 17 sites in total uh, until we can transition over to the summer program. And so how many meals are you serving at those sites for children to receive? Well, it's only 25 meals per site that were, so it's a smaller scale. Um, the marketing right now, because uh, a lot of sites did not know that we were doing that. And we're actually working with the DME's office as far as the marketing, because they have a, a website that they use this year for summer, the coronavirus um, Dot gov site that they have so our, our names were recently added uh yes as of yesterday so and then we're going to do some local marketing uh on twitter to and then we had um it was suggested to post the summer meals sites so banners actually on our sites to uh, add to awareness so the past couple of days we've actually um increased participation has occurred and uh, we're using the attendance sheet. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good number of children that are, you know, it varies by sight. Right. I was just curious um, to refine my question. The children will receive one meal and one snack or two, two meals, just if people, because it's yeah. different than what you were doing in the summer, right? Sure, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, so each child would receive one meal. And if a parent, um, shows up without a child, we only giving the parent just one meal. Um, and then obviously if they have more, ch have children with them, um, then, you know, we will provide the meals per child. Okay. Because we had to set up a plan. Yep. And then really quickly, thanks Angela for mentioning the coronavirus um, DC website. We did want to let you know that that is still up and running. And so, um, 
that'll be utilized, I guess, as you all bring on, if you bring on more SFSP sites, um, that site will be available for uh, promotion of where mail sites are available. Thank you. Liz, the next question is for you. Uh, will the SSO waiver be retroactive back to August 31st? That's a great question. And um, we have, again, posed that to USDA and don't quite have clarity on that yet. Um, but as soon as we do, we will share that out. And apologies if that's my answer for a number of things today. Um, but we had put together a, a quite a list of questions for USDA that has been elevated along with some other surrounding states. Um, and while we know things are allowable, there's a lot of implications and trickle down effects that um, we don't have answers to. We will continue to work and get those answers as soon as we can. And the Liz, there's a follow up question about waivers as well. Um, sure. If a school switches to the summer food service or SSO program, will the milk waivers apply? Great question and a different answer for each, right? So if an SFA had planned to operate the traditional school meal programs and is switching to SSO, any waivers they have applied for, follow them to the program because SSO is, is pretty much a part of NSLP. Um, if an SFA decides to switch and operate SFSP, they need to reapply for waivers. Um, so SFAs can apply for to um, waive the milk component or under SSO specifically, they can, they can apply to waive the requirement that two or more varieties of milk are offered. Um, but make sure that depending on which program you operate, you have applied correctly for those waivers. And I just, oh, I just wanted to mention in um, CACFP, there's not a requirement to offer more than one kind of milk, so. Right, and the next question um, can be answered by both Suzanne and Liz. Um, if a school walks back any changes to the summer food service in the seamless summer option mid-year, uh, for example, if a school starts off doing both of those programs and they become too hard to operate and the school decides to switch back to NSLP um, in the middle of the fall, is that allowable? That's it is allowable. allowable. Yeah, I think one thing I really think is important and, and something to consider here is, again, the communication with your students and families. Um, and that's something to think about as you're making this decision. Um, so while that is allowable, we'd encourage you to communicate with families prior to that going into effect and give them time and give them direction on where else they can get meals um, if that were to be the case. And then Liz, the next question is for you. Um, how will the decision to allow summer food service and SSO operations, um, how will that affect the reimbursement rates for home delivery? Good question. Um, so reimbursement rates for home delivery are the same as other meals served. There's no different reimbursement rate. Um, so if you are serving a meal through SSO, it is the same. It is the free reimbursement rate from NSLP. SFSP has a different reimbursement rate and it is a higher reimbursement rate. So I hope I clarified that. And then Liz, you can answer the next question. If an organization is operating summer food service or SSO, are schools required to provide meals to anyone who shows up? Great question. I will start off, but also Suzanne, please jump in at any point. So um, SFSP and SSO, traditionally the way they are offered is through open meal sites. Um, that is inherent to, to their operations in that they serve anyone in the community, anyone 18 and under can come get a meal. And so yes, under that circumstance, we'd be, per, we'd be required to serve meals to anyone 18 and under who, who showed up for a meal. That said, there are some ways to operate um, non-open sites or what we call open restricted. Um, and there would have to be justification in why someone needed to restrict those sites 
Um, so if that's something people are interested in, I encourage them to reach out to their program specialists on our team to talk through that a little bit more. It's not what we see traditionally, um, but there are some options there. And Suzanne, would you add anything to that? I know you're you're familiar with those types of sites as well. Sure. So in uh, let me pull up my information. <laughs> And the SFSP sites can be classified as open, open restricted, enrolled, um, and closed enrolled. So most sites are open sites, um, but there are options if you're, you know, operating different kinds of programs. If you have security issues, you can um, restrict access to the site in some way. Um, and as Liz said, if you have questions about that, I put Nicole's um, email in the in the chat. And then Suzanne, the next question is for you. It's from Angela Tucker with DPR. Um, can we start the summer food service program on October 1st or should we start at a later date? You can start the, uh, we suggest you start the summer food service program whenever it makes more sen most sense for your operations. We understand that, you know, this is a late in the game change for everyone. And, you know, you have to think through maybe modifying your contract or, you know, just a, a myriad of, of considerations. So starting October 1st is fine. Um, you could start in September if a site, if a sponsor, you know, got their application in and wanted to start in September, that's fine. And if a sponsor wanted to start in November, that is fine as well. And then Liz, the next question is for you. As far as claims for September, should meals be or should meals be claimed through SSO or the NSLP program? That's a great question. And so I would say thus far, plan to claim your meals through NSLP, but we have asked that question of USDA of if, are these retroactive basically? You know, um, for folks that had applied for NSLP and planned to serve NSLP, can they be claimed via SSO? So as soon as we hear an update on that, we will share with you all, but until that update comes, plan to claim meals under NSLP. The next question is for Suzanne. For SFSP, do meals have to be prepared and what type of site would a center be considered if offering food to children that are not enrolled? Right. OK, so if this is a, a child care facility, it would be uh, probably considered an open site um, or open and open restricted. We could talk about that. There's a few different places it could it could fit. Um, and wait, was part of the question, do meals have to be prepared? Um, yes, the first first part of the question was, do meals have to be prepared? So I'm not really sure what that means, but um, through the SFSP program, you can serve grab and go meals. So the meals can be prepped and individualized, uni unitized. You can do that. Um, there is also an option to serve bulk items. This is an option in both SSO and SFSP. Um, so that would be giving people, you know, like a pan of salad or a pan of um, spaghetti and meatballs. Um, and if you do something like that, you'd want to give out a menu. Um, with portion sizes so people understand how they should dish it out and how long it lasts. Um, but yes, meals, that's how meals can be prepared. And then the next question can be answered by both of you. Um, if you serve SSO, which allows two meals, and you serve breakfast and lunch, how can you serve supper if you also have the after school snack program? I will take that. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, um, USDA USDA has not confirmed that both of those programs can be operated simultaneously or at the same time at the same site. Um, like I said, I know that was an option um, March through um, June, but right now we are not clear if that is an option. So I would not. So please don't. Um, start that kind of operation because we don't want you to be serving meals that you can't be reimbursed for. And I'll just add to that, if if that's an important factor that you want to serve, um, you know, breakfast, lunch, and potentially after school snack and supper, 
Suzanne, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could do that by continuing with the National School Lunch Program and Breakfast Program, the traditional um, way you have served during the school year in the past, um, and then serving at-risk supper. Um, Correct. So that would be just continuing in the way that you have, and, and that might be a right fit for some folks if that is, is priority for your organization. And the next question is for Suzanne, and it's also directed towards Angela Tucker with DPR. Um, just clarification, is there a plan for going back to providing multiple days worth of food to parents without children being present, or will DPR not do that at feeding sites going forward? Um, no, we, we will operate a similar fashion uh, as we did in the summer, because we had a couple, we actually had one site that um, we provided meals um, a day in advance. So in other words, they wanted to be able to have meals provided to the children for Saturday. So we provided additional meals on Friday so that kids were able to consume it on Saturday. So it'll just be a, a small select group of sites, which will be, um, yes, that will allow that. And it will be grab and go as well. And that's going to start, um, I just want to make sure it's clear you're going to start that when you start your SFSP program or is that your operations? No, you, that's correct. Um, I will start that for the SFSP program. OK, so that option will become available October 1st. Yes, that's that's okay. our, our target goal. OK. And then the next question is for Suzanne. What will the administrative review process look like for sponsors that utilize the option to operate a summer food service until December of this year and then switch back to CACFP after the waiver has expired? Great question. So for um, SFSP, we have already uh, in the summer, we announced uh, which sponsors were going to receive administrative reviews, um, and that's set. We are not adding additional administrative reviews um, because the program has been extended. Uh, we, we do have a requirement to do some kind of site monitoring, so there could be some site monitoring, but the large administrative reviews for summer are already set. And if you weren't on that list, you won't be picked <laughs> to receive a review. If you switch to CACFP, back to CACFP um, in the winter, um, the administrative review schedule, we're sticking to the traditional, you know, every three years. So if it was your year to have an administrative review for CACFP, you'll receive an administrative review. If you're not um, up for this year, then, then you won't. Um, there's not much change or impact on the CACFP schedule. Thank you. Um, and Suzanne, there's an, another question um, for you. Um, is the only accountability measure at this time uh, for serving food a tally sheet under the Summer Food Service Program? Yes, so um, the Summer Food Service Program um, traditionally point of service is required. It is no longer required. If you, but I do want to say, if you have a meal counting system in place that you're comfortable with and it's point of service, feel free to continue that. Um, I do know that, you know, training uh, sites and staff on a new procedure can become complicated and, you know, that's when mistakes can happen. So feel free to stick with what you were doing before. But yes, now um, the guidance that we have been given is that point of service is not required. What is required is that you are able to, um, that you take account of all the meals served at each site for each day. So it can be a tally for each day. Mm -hmm. And then the next question can be answered by both of you. Is there a meal service program that offers meals to uh, people over the age of 18 uh, where the meals can be reimbursed? Yes, yeah, so um, just strictly in our, in within ASI, the child and adult care food program, um, 
well, first, let me go back to SFSP. Through the Summer Food Service Program, um, adults over the age of 18 can be served, but um, this is uh, restricted to disabled adults. Um, so if a, if a disabled adult were to come to an open site, they can receive meals. The adult does not have to prove <laughs> their disability. There's no verification for that. We don't want you asking people what the disability is. However, um, that, that is an option. Um, in the child and adult care food program, um, there is a program specifically for adult care centers. Um, and that is specifically for centers that are serving um, functionally disabled adults over the age of 18. Um, so it gets a little bit more like it's very, it's the, the requirements are pretty specific, but those are the two options that I'm thinking of through SFSP and CACFP. Do you have anything to add, Liz? I don't know about SSO. No, I think you covered it all. Okay, great. Then we have one more question to answer in the chat, and then I'm going to ask the people that had their hands previously raised to come off mute so they can ask their question. Um, so the next question in the chat um, is for Liz. For SSO, will mills or will menus still be required if we switch from NSLP to the SSO program? Um, I'm not. I'll try to answer the question. I'm not sure I understand it fully, but will menus still be required? I mean, um, folks have to have menus planned to know what they're serving each day. I'm going to anticipate this might be in reference to providing menus with multi days worth of food and bulk items. And if folks are serving multiple days worth of food at a time, or if they're serving bulk items, then the requirement is still in place that they're providing um, those who pick up meals with a menu to show them what bulk items uh, contribute to a reimbursable meal each day. And then Chris Bolin, I saw you had your hand raised earlier. If you can come off mute, you can ask your question now. Hi, good morning. I was wondering um, with the waiver that came out, did you, can you hear me? We can, yeah. Chris. Okay. Um, did USDA decide whether they would supplement staff salaries either with the OSSI staffing funding plan or is there additional funding to pay staff if we want to continue to deliver meals? Great question, Chris. And unfortunately, there are no additional funds provided for serving meals at this time. So the reimbursement rates, um, you know, you're allowed to use the reimbursement rate to cover anything, including packaging, PPE, home, uh, home delivery, all those kind of things. But there is no additional funding provided above and beyond the reimbursement rate. Okay. And, and we've my... heard from many of you, and we know that the nuances of serving in different ways have different costs associated with them. And we have shared um, that concern and those concerns with USDA as have many other states. Okay, and then the second part of my question is, is that we're doing home delivery. So with that home delivery, if we see a child that says, hey, can I have one of those meals? Are we allowed to give them a meal and then tally it out? Under the SSO or SFE, SFSP program, um, meals can be served to anyone, you know, 18 and under, or as Suzanne said earlier, above 18 at times. Um, but I believe home delivery has requirements in place that there's, um, uh, apologies for not having this at the tip of my tongue, but home delivery does have a little bit more requirements in place where there's an agreement between the parents and the SFA or the parents and the sponsor that must be in place prior to delivery. Um, so I don't think while doing a delivery, if there was another student there, that a meal could be provided. Um, okay. Suzanne, does that sound right to you? Yes, I would. I would agree. Um, I yes, I would agree with that. <laughs> it's the same for SFSP. Okay. And Chris, there may be some some 
options that we're happy to talk about with you offline. Um, but that would be the answer to that specific question. Yeah. OK, thank you. So we just have one more hand raised. Um, so Landy, if you can come off mute and ask or ask your question, please. I apologize. That was an accident. I'm really pressing my hand. So at this time, that is all of the questions that we've had in the, the chat feed. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for. Oh, go ahead, Susan. I see someone that says I can't raise my hand in Teams, but they have a question. It's not assigned hey, to a Susan. name. Uh, this is Ben Shea from DC Prep. Am I good to ask? Um, Go ahead, Ben. In like layman's English, the only downside of SS SFSP is that there's more paperwork required, right? Like it's identical to the SSO for schools. So we should just do it and do the application and get the higher reimbursement rate. So do you want to you want to take that, Liz? Sure, I'll, I'll start with it. Um, it is it is very similar, Ben, but not identical, I wouldn't say. So um, I would agree with your assessment that um, if you're considering SSO or SFSP, um, if you would stick with SSO, there's less administrative paperwork, let's say, to do, right? Um, because you don't have to complete an additional application um, and things like that. Um, some slight differences are the meal pattern. Um, so the meal pattern for SFSP is not broken down into age and grade groups, um, nor does it require vegetable subgroups. And I think there are a couple other things within there. So um, it may be simpler to execute, but um, there may not be as much variety in the meals served. Um, anything else to add, Suzanne? Uh, no. No, I think you covered it all. I'm trying to think. You covered it all. <laughs> okay, but we can still offer the variety, right? We just don't have Yeah, to. you can totally offer okay, the variety. Great. Absolutely. Team SFSP all the way. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. We know there were a lot of questions coming in, and we hope we Liz, were helpful. Can yeah. I just break in really quickly? I just Please. think there's a question that's kind of... Um, refining the question about the household. And I do want to make this clear. Sure. Um, it's if a student is a sibling in that same household. Um, so I believe if the student is a sibling in the same household, then an additional delivery would be fine because the agreement must be set up between the parent guardian and that household. So I do believe the additional delivery would be fine if you happen to have additional meals <laughs> on hand. Um, I would say yes to that. That's it. Agreed. All right, well, thank you all. Um, we know that as you're considering these changes, um, there's a lot of questions and hopefully we were able to answer many of them today. Um, on the next two slides, we provided links to OSSI specific guidance, including the health and safety guidance and meal policy guidance. We will continue to provide updates um, through our Beyond the Train newsletters, um, host things on our OSSI website so you can find the resources when needed. And of course, with new information, we will email out to you and host these open calls as needed. Um, we just want to thank you all so much for you know, considering these options and making sure you have the meal service um, program in place that meets the needs of your students and your communities. Um, and encourage you to reach out to anyone on any of our teams with any follow-up questions or additional support. I know there are a lot of nuanced situations, and so we're happy to brainstorm with you and collaborate with you on how you want to provide your email service. Um, I see a question in the chat. Yes, this PowerPoint will be added to the OSSI website in the coming days, um, so it will be available, and we anticipate a Beyond the Train newsletter being released next week that will have the direct link to it. Uh, before we head out, I believe that Nigel will be dropping a very short poll in the chat now to ask you to provide feedback. Um, so please take one minute to let us know how this call was for you. 
And just thank you so much for engaging with us today and for the work that you do for DC students. Have a good rest of your day.